This is peat soil. Its characteristics can help us understand a peatland and make the right decisions for sustainable peatland management. In this video, we will show you how the features and properties of peat soils emerge and how they can change over time, either naturally or through human intervention. In order to describe a peat soil, it is first necessary to look at the characteristics of the parent material. For example, the type of plant remains the peat consists of, or the peat state of decomposition. On the other hand, it is important to record the characteristics of the soil structure, the way the soil is spatially organized. The current features and properties of peat soils have been shaped in two distinct stages. During the peat accumulation in Myers and as a result of human-induced drainage and land use. First, we should look at peat soil formation in peat accumulating mires, shaping the primary characteristics of peat soils. Over time, peat with different characteristics can be deposited in a peat accumulating mire. These deposits are the parent material of the forming soil. Their most important attribute is the peat type. This refers to the specific plants the peat was produced by. There are many peat types, such as sphagnum moss or reed peat, among many others. In different phases of peat accumulation, different peat types can be deposited, depending on abiotic factors. For instance, reed peat usually forms in fens with a high nutrient availability. Should the nutrient availability drop over time, reed beds can gradually be replaced by sedge meadows. On top of the reed peat, sedge peat will form. In this way, peat soil profiles with layers consisting of different peat types can emerge. Being able to identify peat types is important since the peat type heavily influences the chemical and physical properties of a peat soil. Attributes such as pH or the hydraulic conductivity of a peatland soil play a crucial role in the ecology of the wider landscape. Another important attribute of peat as a parent material is its degree of humification a measure for the state of decomposition of the accumulated plant remains. Depending on the oxygen availability and the temperature in the surface layer of a growing mire, fresh plant material can be decomposed to a varying degree before reaching the saturated zone where it will be conserved. A classic example for this can be found in northern German bogs, where peat moss remains have accumulated either a strongly decomposed black peat or a slightly decomposed white peat. The black peat formed mainly during the subboreal climatic period, which started about 6,000 years ago and saw warm, humid conditions. Some 2,500 years ago, temperatures dropped and the amount of precipitation increased. The sub-Atlantic climatic period had started and with it, white peat formation. The wetter, colder conditions inhibited the aerobic decomposition, allowing for faster accumulation due to a much lower rate of decomposition. This example shows why in many peat profiles, there are layers consisting of peat that is more or less decomposed. In terms of the soil structure or the spatial organization of the soil, peat is deposited as an undivided coherent mass. Depending on the degree of humification, it is composed in varying proportions of well-preserved and easily identifiable plant remains and fine, strongly decomposed amorphous material. In many cases, peatlands are drained with deep ditches and used for agriculture or forestry. This sets a whole range of processes in motion that lead to drastic secondary transformations in the peat soil. The ability of peat soil to fulfill important ecological functions is heavily affected. Almost all peatlands in Germany are drained and under human use. This is why, on most sites, the parent material and structural features of the peat soil are mainly shaped by secondary soil formation processes. Let's take a fen soil as an example. Here we will see how secondary soil formation typically unfolds. In the beginning, the peatland is only weakly drained using shallow ditches. However, this is already enough for the oxygen availability in the drained layer to accelerate decomposition and bring peat accumulation to a halt. The drained peat gets decomposed by soil fauna, including earthworms and small arthropods. Through their feeding behavior, these creatures also transform the soil, which becomes dominated by small, somewhat granular soil aggregates. 
This process is called earthification. Additionally, aerobic bacteria are also involved in peat decomposition. They use the carbon in the peat for respiration, then set it free into the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. This process is known as mineralization and is the reason why drained peat soils become a net carbon source. The changes in the peat soil are even more dramatic following deep drainage. Without buoyancy to support it, the drained peat gets compacted and consolidated under its own weight. The soil settles and in a short time, the land surface subsides considerably. As drying peat shrinks, the ensuing tension results in the peat cracking open. First, vertical shrinkage cracks form. Afterwards, transversal cracks form as well, especially in the layers close to the surface. The originally undivided peat material will split apart deeper and deeper, giving rise to sharp-edged soil aggregates. Through shrinkage, the density of the peat increases further, which leads to additional subsidence. What's more, the formation of shrinkage cracks causes a more effective aeration, so now aerobic decomposition processes also affect deeper soil layers. Oxidized peat generally turns darker. Tillage also plays an important role in the secondary transformation of peat soils. Through the plowing of the cropland or grassland, the soil in the upper 15 to 30 centimeters is crushed and homogenized. Additionally, the use of heavy machinery facilitates the formation of straight, horizontal fissures in the peat. Soil compaction also increases. Advancing earthification processes further transform the homogenized topsoil. Meanwhile, shrinkage cracks continue to form. The upward water movement through capillary action is increasingly hindered by the many horizontal and transversal cracks in the soil. Therefore, the topsoil increasingly dries out. This is also highly detrimental for the soil fauna. Because of the weak biological activity, the biogenic granular structure of the topsoil cannot be maintained any longer. The granular aggregates fall apart, giving rise to a very fine, grainy, dusty, and water repellent material. This degradation process is known as strong earthification. This fine, strongly earthified soil can then re-aggregate, forming particularly dense aggregates. With deep drainage, mineralization occurs in a much thicker layer of the peat. Because of this, massive carbon dioxide emissions ensue. The peat soil literally disappears into thin air and the land surface subsides further. For the total loss in elevation that follows drainage and is caused by the combined effects of peat settlement, shrinkage, and mineralization, the term peatland subsidence is used. After decades of drainage, deep peatlands can subside up to several meters. Peatland subsidence and peat soil compaction can cause problems on a landscape level. For example, the land surface can sink below the water level in nearby rivers or below sea level. Such areas are prone to flooding and can only be kept dry by continuous and expensive pumping. Furthermore, Shrunken, compacted peat loses its ability to swell and effectively take up water. This is how drained peatlands lose their ability to store water in the landscape. And now, let's take a look at how and why soil scientists need to examine peat soils in detail. So the first question is, how can soil characteristics be systematically recorded? If we look at a soil profile, we will see that different soil forming processes reach more or less deeply into the soil. This leads to the formation of distinct soil layers with somewhat uniform parent material and structural characteristics. These layers are called soil horizons. In the German soil systematics, they bear the name of the main soil forming process that shaped them. For example, strongly earthified horizon or peat shrinkage horizon. In soil science, it is necessary to identify soil horizons as the presence of diagnostic horizons or certain horizon combinations determines the soil types that one can find on a soil map. What's more, after horizon identification, a soil can be correctly sampled. In this way, analyses performed in the lab will yield conclusive results. In the particular case of peatlands, identifying soil horizons is especially relevant. If horizons are identified correctly, it is possible to understand which processes have shaped a peatland. 
and what challenges a certain site poses with regard to sustainable peatland management. For instance, the presence of a strongly earthified horizon is an indicator for unfavorable hydraulic properties. Such sites are highly prone to desiccation. Strongly earthified peat becomes hydrophobic and has a high resistance to taking up water. This affects plant growth and poses a big challenge for peatland rewetting in case such a project is implemented. Furthermore, re-aggregated, aggregated, and peat shrinkage horizons are known to obstruct either the vertical or the lateral water flows through the peat. This fact has to be taken into consideration when regulating the water table in a peatland. Water table management is relevant both for a more climate-friendly cultivation and for the restoration of peatlands. Another important aspect is assessing the depth of earthified and strongly earthified horizons and, more generally, of all horizons that have been influenced by tillage. These layers have high nutrient concentrations following the application of fertilizers. They generally need to be removed if typical Meyer vegetation is to be successfully re-established. For peatland rewetting, the peat type and the degree of humification in the subsoil or the soil base are especially important. When rewetting a bog, it is advantageous to have a strongly decomposed peat layer deep in the soil, for example, black peat. Thanks to its low hydraulic conductivity, it will act as a seepage barrier, retaining the rainwater in the peat above. When rewetting fens, such impermeable layers are a problem. Groundwater cannot easily flow upwards through these layers, therefore too little water ever reaches the peat layers near the surface. For recording the characteristics of peat soils, different resources exist in Germany. The standard is set by the German Soil Mapping Guidelines. Additionally, for identifying peat type or other types of peatland deposits, there are the portraits of peatland deposits. And for the identification of structural characteristics and horizons, there is the new Wikimos Field Guide. Peatlands are valuable. It's worth protecting them. And peat soils are a really solid reason. <laughs> <laughs>